In 1800, there are around 7,000 full-blooded Aboriginal people in Tasmania. By 1847, there were 47. Here's why. Britain's jails were filling up in the late 18th century. Debt imprisonment and the loss of American colonies meant the empire needed another faraway land to send its vast numbers of prisoners. That land was New South Wales, Australia. Pretty soon, though, Australia began getting tired of this situation, with a growing free settler population now not wanting to live so close to so many convicts. As a result, the Australian mainland started sending its unwanted prisoners to a yet more isolated location, Tasmania. This had the additional effect of bolstering the British presence on the island, helping prevent the French from getting their hands on it. The first permanent British settlement at Risdon Cove was established in September 1803 for just this reason. Within eight months, 50 Aboriginal people were shot by soldiers at the base. Now, the British government did ask the Lieutenant Governor of the colony, David Collins, to punish violence against the Aboriginal people. But he didn't even bother to publish these orders, let alone follow them. Blatant lack of legal accountability is going to be a running theme. Over the next few years, more and more convicts began to arrive, along with free settlers. The conditions for these people were uniquely terrible, though, even for Australia. Firstly, in 1805, the colony nearly suffered a famine due to British food shipments being late. This forced the colonists to hunt kangaroos, which put them in competition with the Aboriginal people, whose food supply would further shrink as the colonists repurposed thousands of acres of their hunting grounds for sheep. There was also a significant gender imbalance, with about three men for every woman among the white population, even as late as the mid-1830s. Out of all the hardships the colonists experienced, though, the one that most directly led to genocide was the brutal violence which they themselves faced. At the height of British legal severity, most white Tasmanians were prisoners. The Tasmanian system was even stricter than that in the UK. Constant floggings desensitized the people to torture. Public executions had a similar effect, with 134 hanged between 1823 and 1827 for crimes ranging from murder to livestock theft. For perspective, in all of England and Wales between 1829 and 1830, only 120 were hanged. Most judges in the UK would opt for transportation rather than capital punishment, but by the time someone got to Tasmania, there were few places left to go besides the gallows. The living weren't in great shape either. Of the 36.5 thousand colonists in 1835, 1181 were in the Port Arthur prison, a fortress-like complex where even children were flogged hundreds of times. Paradoxically, aside from the strictest institutions like Port Arthur, escape was relatively easy. The government sent convicts to such far-flung places like Tasmania not just to get rid of them, but also to use them as a source of forced labor. Because of this, most prisoners spent a lot of their time outside of dedicated prisons, clearing land, working on farms, and doing other forms of manual labor. They were by no means free, being essentially slaves, but were not under the constant containment and supervision which characterizes modern prison life. Escapees would often become bushrangers, criminals who evaded capture by hiding in the wilderness, and who stole goods, killed people and animals, and were generally a massive headache for the colony. The government responded with a policy of extermination, encouraging vigilantism and bounty hunting. Local media published lists of runaways, and martial law was instituted in 1815. These actions set a precedent that perceived threats to the colony should be violently eradicated, and that the colonists themselves should feel encouraged to lend a hand. All of these different problems, from the lack of government accountability to the lack of food to most of all the violence, pointed towards one common cause, British negligence and cruelty. The societal trauma inflicted on the white Tasmanians by the British manifested itself in their even more brutal treatment of the Aboriginal people. Speaking of, with less and less land each passing year, the Aboriginal people were in a desperate state. About 1,500 square miles of their land in the south and east, the best for raising sheep and the most accessible to white settlements, had been given away for free by the colonial government from 1817 to 1828. As well, settlers had been raping and enslaving Aboriginal women and children unpunished since the colony's founding, with this only increasing as time went on. At times, Aboriginal people were simply shot on sight, again with no repercussions. 
Aboriginal people made comparatively few attacks against whites in retaliation for all of this, but settlers still saw them as an existential threat. As violence continued to escalate through the 1810s and into the early 1820s, it became clear that an all-out war was on the horizon. In May of 1824, the colony got a new lieutenant governor, George Arthur. Arthur at first did want to calm the situation down, declaring equal protection under the law for Aboriginal people and for whites. However, attacks continued without punishment. By then, only about 1,500 Aboriginal people were left. The local press had become bloodthirsty, claiming that a total eradication by the settlers was the only possibility left. The frequent but generally isolated attacks of years prior had truly turned into a guerrilla war by 1824. In November of 1826, Arthur made what was in effect a declaration of this war, giving official government approval for attacking Aboriginal tribes if the whites in the area believed that the tribe was planning to do the same. Given the warmongering by the media and the general paranoia among the settlers, this belief was very common. Still, up until and for most of 1828, Arthur thought there was a chance for peace. Pictures like these were distributed to demonstrate that Aboriginal people and whites should be punished equally for the same crimes. Arthur also attempted to strictly segregate Aboriginal people from whites to prevent violence dividing the island between the largely white areas in the south and east and the aboriginal areas in the western mountains. Unfortunately, all of these measures failed. Attacks increased exponentially from 1826 to 1827 and continued to through 1828. Because of this, in November of 1828, Arthur officially revoked all legal protections for aboriginal people and, just as had been done with the bushrangers, instituted martial law. Parties of soldiers, police, and free settlers began roaming the bush, hunting down and killing every Aboriginal person they could find. In October of 1830, nearly 2,200 colonists, a huge portion of the population, organized into what was called the Black Line and swept across the whole of the island. Thankfully, this particular attempt was mostly unsuccessful, as the remaining Aboriginal people simply hid as they passed through, but the damage was done there were only about 600 Aboriginal people left. All of this violence came to be known together as the Black War, with some saying it started all the way back in 1803 and others when martial law was declared in 1828, while most put it somewhere in the early to mid-1820s. It ended with the end of martial law in 1832, though the suffering of Aboriginal people continued. Starting in 1829, those who were left were being relocated to prison camps and eventually moved off of the Tasmanian mainland altogether and into the Wibbelina camp on Flinders Island, established in 1833. The main supporter of this move was a man named George A. Robinson, who had seen and documented many of the hardships which the Aboriginal people faced during this time, and who thought the only way that they could survive was being transported off the island. The government refused to adequately supply the camp, though lacking basic essentials like blankets and clean water, leading to the deaths of around 85% of those incarcerated. Of these prisoners at Wibbelina was Truganini, formerly believed to be the last full-descent Aboriginal person. Being born in 1812, she witnessed so much death in her family and around her at the hands of colonists and so much cultural change that she's come to symbolize the grief of the Aboriginal Tasmanians as a whole. Today, about 4% of people in Tasmania have some sort of Aboriginal heritage. They're still here, but you can't deny the history of it. That history is that men, women, and children were murdered indiscriminately and with the goal of complete extermination of their people. That's beyond just individual crimes, beyond just military action even, that's clearly genocide. I've presented most of this in a pretty removed and academic-ish way, but I don't want that to distract you from how wretched all of this is. I can't imagine the experience of Truganini and the others at Wibbelina seeing kind of your whole world fall apart over 20 or so years. 